All right, now we're going to go on to Unit 8, which is safety. And you have heard me for the last seven units uh, talk about your number one job as a CNA is to keep your residents safe. Um, I can't stress that enough. Uh, this unit goes into why, why, what would make keeping residents safe uh, more difficult, right? And it's things like conf uh, confusion and forgetfulness um, it might cause some judgment issues. You know, they they don't know not to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night without help, or they might drink something they're not supposed to, or eat something they're not supposed to, or um, they might smoke in their rooms. You know, why on, on oxygen? You know, some faulty judgment might be in play with confusion or dementia. Um, they might be impaired mobility. They might, believe it or not, people have actually, when they have strokes and they are paralyzed one side of the body, uh, they forget. They forget they're paralyzed and they try to get up. Or they're weak and they, they think they can get up and go to the bathroom by themselves. They have for 90 years. Why can't they do it now? But they forget, you know, they have mobility that they're just not as strong as they used to be. Um, they might have dizziness or tremors or slowed reflexes um, that may complicate this. Um, remember we have sensory impairments as we age. Our vision gets worse. Um, our hearing gets worse. Um, we have de diminished sensation in our fingers and our feet and we can't feel pressure as well, right? Um, we might have a diminished sense of smell or taste, so we don't know it's something bad for us, we shouldn't drink it, right? Or we can't smell of, of fire, um, smoke, right? Um, the number one injury in nursing homes is falls. So we really put a lot of time and effort into fall prevention because it's the leading cause of death. People will fall and uh, they can break a hip or break a bone and they end up having to have hosp or be in the hospital and have surgery, then they develop pneumonia or have a stroke and they die, right? What I saw working with people who operated on brain at the clinic was we would have uh, older people who would fall and hit their head, mostly in the bathroom. It always seemed like they hit their head on the toilet or the sink and then they'd have a brain bleed and and their brain would bleed and they'd have pressure on the brain and then they'd start declining and so what my surgeons would do is they literally would do what we call a burr hole and they would drill holes through the scalp and suck that blood out to release the pressure on the brain so falls are serious guys people can die from falls right it causes many complication um we got to think about clothing. When people come into nursing homes, they're usually heavier set, and the longer they're there, the more weight they lose. And we'll talk about that a lot more in nutrition. But we got to consider their clothing might be long and baggy. Sometimes they love those tie bath robes that they trip over. Um, again, we got to remember non slid shoes, no slipper socks. Uh, we need to keep things in reach right we need to make sure they have what they need they have their call light so they can call if they need something instead of trying to get up or lean to get it themselves we need to make sure we have that clear walkway right we don't want anything in their path we want adequate lighting we want them to have their walker if they need it they need whatever they might need to walk no throw red throw rugs reds Throw rep, rep, huh? Throw rugs. Easy for me to say today. No extension cords or cords out in the walkway. Um, we want um, to. Um, I it says something about using bed rails, but at this point, bed rails in nursing homes is, are not allowed. They are considered a restraint. If we need to restrain somebody or put them in a restraint, we have to have a doctor's order. We have to release it every two, one to two hours for 10 to 15 minutes. And we have to, we can't use it if somebody's in the room with them. 
So we really, really, really don't like to use bed rails or any other kind of restraint. We do a lot of one-on-ones um, so that we can help try and keep people safe. Uh, use brakes on wheelchairs, no free rides. In the hallways, make sure they have access to the, usually there's a, a, a rail that they can walk along. We need to make sure equipment is all on one side of the hall so they have a straight shot so they don't have to walk around it. We want to um, make sure when they're toileting that is this somebody I can give a few minutes on the toilet and stand outside the door or is it somebody I need to stand in there while they're on the toilet because people will fall and slip in the bathroom. And so some people, we don't leave the room when they're going to the bathroom. We have to stay in there with them. Their care plan will tell you if you need to stay in there or you can stand outside the door. Uh, we want to report any malfunctioning equipment and to maintenance so that we don't have any uh, risk of it tripping up or breaking on our resident when we're doing uh, transfers. Now, the next one, it talks about burns. How would a resident get burned? That's silly, right? Well, have you ever run your bath water too hot, right? Or turned on your shower too hot? We could do that to residents. So we really have to check water temperatures. Now I know it talks about uh, using a thermometer, but, and we had a big wooden one that for a bathtub thermometer, but now most water heaters in the bathrooms are set at a certain amount and they can't go over that amount. And so water temperature is still a concern, but it, we don't spend a lot of times using a thermometer. Always check water temperature on the inside of your wrist or your forearm. And we do that because it's still sensitive. You know, we get nice and tanned and hard skin on the outside of our arm, but it's still more sensitive on the inside of the arm. Uh, when people are eating, you know, they still drink coffee. They like hot chocolate. They have soup, cappuccino, you know. So we have to be careful with those liquids. liquids. We have to make sure that they're safe. When they have food, how would you know food is still hot when you're feeding somebody? Any ideas? Hmm. Well, think about it this way. If it's steam coming off of it, it's probably still hot, right? Are you going to stick your finger in it to touch it, to fill it? Please don't. That's gross. Are you going to take a bite of it? No, that's infection control. One thing you can do is touch the bottom of the dish or cup. If that's still hot, that means there's still warmth in the food. So stir. So if you're feeding somebody, you might have to feed them cold stuff first. The fruit, the dessert. There's no rules. They can eat dessert first. Come on. Um, so make sure when you're feeding them that you're not uh, putting hot food in their mouth. One way to do that also is take a little on the spoon and touch their bottom lip with it and ask them if it's too hot. So make sure you check that. The other thing is a lot of the nursing homes now, they have a big kitchen and then they put the food in containers and then they take them out to the neighborhoods and the neighborhoods have a kitchenette where they have steam tables and that keeps the food warm while the dietary aid uh, dishes it out for meals. We gotta make sure they can't get in there and get burnt from those steam tables or the microwave or anything in there, right? So you need to make sure and keep them safe that way. Now the other thing is smoking, right? Don't do it, it's bad for you. I'm gonna get that plug in while I can. But residents have a right to smoke. That is their right. Now, most all facilities are no smoking. You can't smoke inside the building. Most facilities have a smoking area outside. Now, a lot of times, um, if it's somebody that may drop their cigarettes or drop their ashes on themselves, they might have to wear a smoking apron. And what that is, is have you ever gone to the dentist and had x-rays and they put a big lead apron over your chest and your uh, yourself to keep all your internal organs away from the radiation? 
same thing. That's what a smoking apron is. And it basically protects them from being burnt or burning their clothes. Now, another thing with smoking is they have to have a staff member with them. And don't worry if you don't smoke, the aides that smoke will find them when it's time to go out for a cigarette. Um, that I know to be true, they will. Um, now, what would you do if you found somebody smoking in their room? Scold them like a child? No, that's not right. We have to ask them to put it out and then we talk to them as an adult saying that's not allowed. Would you like to go outside to smoke? We do not usually let them keep cigarettes and lighters in their rooms uh, because it is a safety issue. Now, we may use heating pads or cold packs in the room. Um, the important thing is that when we use these, we have to have a doctor's order, right? They have to be limited time, like to 20 to 30 minutes, and we have to check the skin every five minutes. And the reason being is because remember they have that decreased sensation and they may burn themselves. So it's important that we're checking the skin and we're making sure that it's not burning them. Now, why do people like heat? What does it do? Why would you do it? They like heat because it relaxes the muscle and it increases circulation to that area to help with pain control. Now, some people like ice. Are you an ice person? I'm not. Unless it's an acute inner injury, I don't like ice. Ice is painful to me, right? Because I don't like to be cold. But ice helps inflammation, right? It takes down swelling and it numbs that area. So some people really like ice. So you may see both used in the nursing home. Now, electrical injuries are basically due to electronics, right? So one thing we do when people come into a facility is they have to have um, every electronic device they bring into the facility checked by maintenance. And then maintenance will check and make sure it's safe and put a tag on it and give it back to the resident. And this is because we have to prevent chance of fires, right? The other thing is if you see outlets and they're blackened, you need to be telling maintenance. That's an indication it may be a fire. It's uh, been burned, right? Um, frayed, we don't use equipment or personal items with frayed cords. Um, we don't um, use extension cords. I'm going to say that again. Or power strips. That's a big no-no. Um, make sure you're just paying attention. Even the bed cords can get frayed. The cord, it, if the bed smooshes it against the wall, sometimes it'll tear the cord, uh, the lifts, the cords can get pinched. Make sure you're checking those cords before you use the equipment. Just pay attention. Next, we'll talk about chemicals. Now, the, the new rules, not new, but the rules from OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, states that we have to have chemicals in the original bottles with the original label. We cannot use bottles, I'm trying to see if I have one here, without a label, right? That's a no-no, right? We have to know what's in it, what it's used for, what to do if they drink it, splash it on their skin, or, or get it in their eyes. And so all chemicals need to be in an original bottle with original label. Now, for every chemical that we have in a facility, we have to have an MSDS material safety data sheet and we usually have a binder on the hallway that tells us exactly what chemicals that are on the unit now it's obvious things like cleaning stuff uh, soaps um, laundry soaps um, you know disinfectants but things you might not think about are fingernail polish fingernail polish remover if there's paints like art paints if there's a hand sanitizer, all these things have to be put away. They have to be, they're supposed to be behind a lock because residents have drank them or tried to eat them. So it's important that we keep
things in original bottles and keep them behind lock and key. Now, my funny for this is that we have to remember that people ha have confusion and they might be thirsty and so they're gonna drink it. Um, I was doing a clinical for a medication aid class and it was after lunch and med aid class is a little different because you just, you do meds and then you study. So there's a lot of sitting and studying. So all these med aid students had brought their drinks back from lunch and they were sitting on the table in the bistro and with all our stuff and I went and made rounds and checked on the med aids and I come back this little resident had rolled herself up to the table and she was downing all of these drinks. She literally had Red Bull, Monster, Starbucks, and I mean, she just downed them. I mean, she, all of them were empty by the time I got back. And I said, Miss B, are you thirsty? And she said, not anymore. Well, I gave her a ride back and let the nurse know that she'd been consuming energy drinks. She might want to check her blood pressure, uh, but she was thirsty. She saw something to drink, she drank it right so you got to be aware of that too if you're leaving your monster out on the dining room table thinking everybody's in bed somebody might walk out and take, drink it okay so you need to make sure you're aware of where your chemicals are where the drinks are one of the teachers said they had like mexican food night and the dietary aid left the jalapeno juice out the jalapenos were gone and she left the jalapeno juice out on the counter of the kitchenette and one of the residents got it and drank it and was vomiting all night long. So make sure that you're aware of where stuff is. Um, just a side note about the MSDS, another term that has kind of changed um, and the state of Kansas hasn't caught up yet, they're called SDSs now, safety data sheets. But for your class, they're called an MSDS. Not to be confused with what we make care plans off of, which is your MDS, right? Don't forget that, don't get those mixed up. Now we're gonna talk about choking. There are three things a person cannot do if they truly have an airway obstruction, choking. They can't breathe and they can't talk and they can't cough, right? If they can't do those three things, we need to intervene. We need to do the Heimlich maneuver. We take our fist, we put it right above their abdomen, we wrap our arms around, we put our other hand on it, and we're gonna go up and in. If it's somebody pregnant or too big to go around their waist, you can go mid chest, or you can lay them on the ground in abdominal thrust. Now, it's very important you take BLS, basic life support, which is the new term for CPR, right? You learn more than just CPR. That's why it's called basic life support now. Just for taking this class, you get a discount to take it. So we offer it every two, two days a week. So make sure you get signed up for that by the end of this class. It's important for you to have. Now, other things you might see when somebody is choking is they may tear, their eyes get really big. They may be turning gray or blue around the lips. We call that cyanosis and they may be holding their throat, right? This is the universal sign for choking. So make sure that you know the, to watch people and if they can't breathe, cough, or talk, you need to do the Heimlich maneuver. Now the question always comes up, if they're a DNR, which is do not resuscitate, meaning they don't want rescue breathing or chest compressions, do we do the Heimlich? What do you think? Yes, we do the Heimlich because they're not dead, right? But if we don't do the Heimlich, they're gonna end up dead, right? So we do do Heimlich maneuver on residents who are DNRs. Now, if the obstruction becomes complete and they go into cardiac arrest, then we stop, right? Because we can't do chest compressions and rescue breathing. It's a gray line, I know, but know who your residents are that are DNRs for sure. Usually there's a way marked um, 
at Catholic Care, they if they are a code, they have a green dot by their name. Uh, some places they wear a bracelet if they're a, if they want CPR, right? You'll you'll see when you go to clinicals, there's not a lot of people that aren't DNRs in nursing homes. Most of them had a good life and they're they're okay with dying, or they understand that's that's just part of their life at this point. Um, we need to make sure that people are eating correct foods. Um, when we talk about nutrition, we're going to talk about different consistencies of diets and liquids and we need to make sure they have the right stuff because if they're choking and gagging and aspirating, which is taking food, fluid, or vomit into the airway, they can cause pneumonia and they can die from aspiration. So we want to make sure that we're giving them the correct food, fluid, and, and 